Consciousness is a metaphor of reality. When you hold something in mind, this is a metaphor of holding something with your hands. This metaphorical consciousness cannot exist unless it is represented to a subject. And this subject is also a metaphor, namely the metaphor we have of ourselves, which is also called the ego. Consciousness needs a center, writes Jung, an ego to which something is conscious. We know of no other kind of consciousness, nor can we imagine a consciousness without an ego. There can be no consciousness when there is no one to say, I am conscious. Whenever we are conscious of something, for instance, if you become conscious of your breathing, it feels like this fact is presented to an I. I know that I am breathing. This I is not really ourselves, but is actually our ego, the part of ourselves which we hold in consciousness, or in other words, our conscious sense of self. We even spatialize this sense of self, so that it feels as though we are inside our brains, looking out of the eyes. And it is difficult to realize that this is just a metaphorical conception, and this mind space can be located anywhere. The ego is an ongoing metaphor we produce and grow as our self-concept evolves. As we have discussed in previous videos, any idea has various paraphrans or connotations associated with it. If I ask you to think of the word country, you may think of various aspects or paraphrans which are associated with the idea of a country, such as the flag, the landmass, or the people that live there. Similarly, the idea of yourself contains various ideas which you associate with yourself. This includes your personality, shaped by your life experiences, your beliefs, and how you wish to come off to others. However, careful analysis of the ego reveals that we often deceive ourselves or are simply ignorant as to who we actually are. In other words, the ego is our ideal self, who we want to be if we were given a choice. But it is also who we think we are, irrespective of the facts. This idea can be best understood if we consider an analogy. Consider a method actor or actress. Highly skilled actors attempt to embody the character they are playing, not just to pretend to be someone else, but to really experience life through this character's eyes while the cameras are rolling. However, once the cameras are done filming, this character vanishes, and they go back to being themselves. When the actor takes on this role, their ego is transformed into the ego of an entirely different, fictional person. Even if you aren't an actor, you are always playing a similar role. This includes an outward role, which we call the persona, but it also includes an inward role, which we call the ego. The ego is a fictional character, which we superimpose onto our actual selves. During your life, you create a fictional character, which you believe to be yourself, and go on playing this role, just as an actor embodies a fictional character. Although the ego may seem like our actual selves, oftentimes, a great part of the psyche lies beneath our conscious awareness, and so the ego is not the entirety of the self. This character is shaped to a great degree by societal expectations and cultural standards, as we tend to adopt the cultural norm into our personalities. For instance, if you grow up watching football, you will likely incorporate being a football fan into your ego. Or if you grow up listening to classic rock, this will become a feature of the idea of yourself. This is why people from different cultures can have fundamentally different egos, since they are taught different standards of what it means to be a person. The ego is placed at the center of all acts of consciousness and behaves as a protagonist in the story of our lives. One significant part of consciousness is narratization, which is a process of fitting the going-ons in your life into a story, which places you at the center of it. For instance, if you become distracted at work, you need to narratize yourself back into the story of whatever it was you were doing, in order to regain your focus and continue your task. The ego both creates and participates in this narrative. Since the ego is fundamentally a character we are playing, it often occurs that how a person perceives themselves is at odds with reality. A person may think of themselves as remarkably intelligent, but in reality be quite stupid. Or a person may think of themselves as unintelligent, when they are really quite thoughtful and insightful. The ego's tendency to idealize itself causes it to reject notions which are contrary to the idea of ourselves, resulting in the formation of a layer of the unconscious called the shadow.
where our personality traits, which are incongruent to the ego's perception of itself, become repressed and hidden away from consciousness. This includes traits which are not in accordance with the moral standards which we believe in. In fact, it is the imposition of certain standards and moral guidelines which initially causes the feeling of self, since the psyche will inevitably discover a conflict between the natural hereditary instincts and these standards. The ego thusly conceals a great deal of the personality, which otherwise remains unconscious. It acts as a barrier between the unconscious and consciousness, and is able to selectively allow or inhibit unconscious contents. For instance, you may suddenly become reminded of a time you felt embarrassed, such as a job interview that went awry, or a time you said something stupid when trying to impress someone. If these memories produce negative emotions, the ego may try to suppress them, or in other words, you may try to think about something else instead. On the contrary, you may want to remember something pleasant, and so the ego will allow this memory to be accessed by consciousness. This function of regulating the contents of consciousness allows a person to redirect their psyche towards specific goals, something which we will discuss shortly. The ego is responsible for our sense of free will. It is the part of ourselves that acts with agency and asserts itself in accordance with our desires, and so the ego frequently thinks of itself as responsible for all actions and thoughts. However, Deeper analysis reveals that it is often the unconscious psyche which really controls behavior, and consciousness is greatly influenced by the unconscious. Our thoughts and actions often have a significant basis in the unconscious psyche, and are only justified by consciousness. And so our consciousness may convince ourselves to act in accordance with the unconscious. For example, when you procrastinate, this tendency arises from the impulse of unconscious. But the ego can convince itself of this choice by making all sorts of arbitrary justifications. Despite this, consciousness can assert its agency and take control of the psyche to some extent, whenever the unconscious is uncooperative and leads us against our conscious intentions. The ego is also closely bound with our belief structure about the world, since how we think about the world is closely attached to our personality. The things we were taught as children will greatly influence us later in life and determine how we think about the world, sometimes leading us into adopting an overly simplistic vision of reality. Once a belief structure becomes solid, the ego crystallizes and will generally reject information which may cause this psychic structure to disintegrate. Having your beliefs challenged can often feel like an attack on your personality, and the ego will naturally try to defend itself against this attack. The ego resisting disintegration is why some people will remain closed-minded and will not be able to be convinced of any point which challenges their pre-established beliefs. Such people may even defend their point of view prodigiously, even when presented with facts which clearly prove them wrong. This may sound like a bad thing, but keep in mind that this is what the ego naturally does, since people depend upon having a solid belief structure in order to function in the world and disintegration of the ego can lead to neurosis in the form of an existential crisis. However, being too rigid can prevent a person from learning anything new, especially with topics which demand an open mind. This state of mind is often called ego inflation, and people with highly inflated egos not only defend their beliefs, but are also highly sensitive to criticism, which may erode their perceived sense of self. People who think of themselves in a high regard for instance, people who think of themselves as exceptional cooks or as exceptionally talented athletes will tend to lash out at any notion to the contrary. This inflated sense of self can prevent a person from improving themselves since they are convinced that there is nothing to improve, and a failure to honestly evaluate their own character can be quite troublesome. Being unconscious of oneself will inevitably lead to an eruption of the unconscious and ego deflation. As Jung writes, civilized life today demands concentrated, directed conscious functioning, and this entails the risk of a considerable dissociation from the unconscious. The further we are able to remove ourselves from the unconscious through directed functioning, the more readily a powerful counterposition can build up in the unconscious, and when this breaks out, it may have disagreeable consequences. Ego deflation can be dangerous, since, without a rigid sense of self, we may be unable to direct ourselves in any meaningful way.
However, it also ends an opportunity for psychological growth through a process called the transcendent function. The ego can expand in two directions, outwards and inwards. In order to expand, the ego first needs to break down. This allows contents of the unconscious to come forward and give the ego new information. This new insight may pertain to the world, allowing one to change their belief system, but it can also pertain to the self and give a person a more complete picture of themselves. Having a rigid, inflated ego prevents this opportunity for growth until the unconscious forces its way into a person's life. People who are open-minded have egos which are more flexible and therefore less crystallized. Such people may be more attuned to their unconscious, since the unconscious is better equipped to handle new information, as opposed to consciousness, which prefers what it already knows. Being attentive and open to criticism allows one to improve themselves and find flaws within themselves, which they ordinarily block out. This is why other people sometimes know us better than we know ourselves, because the ego tries to maintain a particular self-image, which may not reflect who we really are. Expanding our consciousness can include, as already mentioned, consciousness of the self and consciousness of the exterior world. To learn anything new, it is necessary to allow the unconscious to come forth, since the rigid attitude of ego consciousness is hostile to new ideas, which initially appear foreign. However, this attitude can potentially lead to the reverse problem, where instead of having a grand sense of self, a person thinks little of themselves and lacks self-confidence. Feeling small and insignificant can cause a person to disregard their own self-worth. When you think of yourself as unimportant, you may not do what is in your best interest and act contrary to what is really good for you. This can also lead to neurosis and depression which is why the ego should generally possess a certain degree of self-importance. While the ego may prevent us from accessing new insights, it is important not to treat the ego as something which is inherently bad. The ego has an important role in organizing psychic activity and is in some sense like the captain of our psychic ship, bringing together opposing elements of the psyche in order to pursue specific goals. Ego consciousness and its opposition to the unconscious is responsible for everything that makes humans different from animals. As Jung writes, the definiteness and directedness of the conscious mind are extremely important acquisitions which humanity has bought at a very heavy sacrifice, and which in turn have rendered humanity the highest service. Without them, science, technology, and civilization would be impossible, for they all presuppose the reliable continuity and directedness of our conscious process. It is our ego, the protagonist of the story of our lives, which can directly order the psyche, and it is needed whenever the unconscious takes control of ourselves. Sometimes, our unconscious minds can also give us trouble, and only a strong ego can prevent this chaos from overwhelming us. A good example would be someone who is trying to quit smoking. Smoking is an addictive behavior, which means people who smoke do so with little conscious effort. This is because... Once a behavior becomes a habit, we no longer need our full conscious awareness to do it, and it becomes relegated to the unconscious. Quitting smoking, and indeed, quitting any bad habit, requires a strong ego consciousness to filter our unconscious habits and redirect us towards our goals. This entails having an ego that can stop unconscious impulses and direct the psyche towards a more healthy way of living. And the same is true whenever we want to accomplish something, where our unconscious instincts are inadequate. This example demonstrates why the relationship between consciousness and the unconscious is highly dynamic and not at all simple. We need to learn how to utilize both consciousness and the unconscious to the maximum possible benefit, since both these realms of the psyche have their downsides and upsides. The expansion of consciousness, so vital for adapting to changing circumstances, depends upon weakening the ego but one also needs a strong ego in order to avoid being absorbed by the unconscious. This may sound like a difficult balancing act, but the ego needs to experience periods of both strength and weakness in order to achieve psychological maturity. Thus, in order to be psychologically whole, one needs to treat both the ego and the unconscious as essential portions of the human psyche.